Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. I, I think our speaker system is fairly loud, but can everyone hear us over here? Great, thank you. So glad to see all these smiling faces today. We only had a few days notice, so I'm glad the word got out because we are so excited to host our special guest today. As you know, he's here for a discussion and signing of his new book, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Colonel Chris Hadfield. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It, it's a delight to be here, and thanks everybody for coming out on a sunny afternoon. Uh, what I really just want to have a conversation with you for a few minutes, um, but let me talk about launch first. It, it's a, um, I wonder how this thing will do. It's an amazing day to, uh, to leave Earth. When, when you wake up in the morning and you know that that this is the day you're gonna leave the planet, especially when you've been dreaming about it your whole life. It's, um, it, it kind of puts a whole aura over the whole, imagine if you knew that later today you were gonna leave Earth. Imagine what that would, how that would make you think when you went to bed last night and how you felt when you woke up this morning. And it, it puts a, kind of a, a definite separate feeling to the whole day where you become sort of hyper aware of all of the things that are happening as you get dressed and, and then um, riding out to the launch pad it, where, where you're sitting with people that you've been training with for years and you're, you're driving towards this vehicle that is going to take you to a place that is right on the edge of impossible. And it's sitting out there, and this isn't a, um, an airport or a seaport, it's sitting there at a spaceport. This is where humans leave the earth and come back again. And, and it, uh, in Florida, it sits up, if you've been there, it sits up high on sort of a big raised platform above the floodplain. So it almost looks religious, like some big obelisk. Uh, and you're almost always driving out early in the day, so it's lit up by big xenon lights. And as we were driving out, I was thinking, this must have been how it felt for Ramses when he was looking at some of the great big monuments that the Egyptians built thousands of years ago. And then you, you ride an elevator up and you're wearing your big orange pressure suit and you feel, uh, you know, like this is a big day in your life. And then you have to crawl into the space shuttle, which it's funny, you go from being this triumphant driving out to this huge monument astronaut, and now there's this hole about this big around. It's like crawling into somebody's tree fort where you get down on your hands and knees and you crawl down through some holes and the vehicle is sitting like that. So what should be the floor is the wall and, and the back window is the, is the new floor. So you gotta climb up into your chair and get yourself you know, sort of wedged in. And then there's one astronaut in there whose job it is is to, is to strap you in. And uh, my, my wife wrote me a note, and so he passed me a nice note for my wife, this other astronaut. And then my wife had given him a kiss and said, here, give my husband this kiss. <laughs> so, so the astronaut gave me a manly kiss on the forehead. And, and, then, um, and then once everyone's strapped in, then they uh, go through and they take all the pads out, close the hatch, and start doing pressure checks in the vehicle and you're gonna, you're gonna go maybe today. And you've been denying in your mind that you could actually leave Earth today because you can never let it be real. It, it would drive you crazy if you thought that, that everything in your life was wrapped up in going to space on that day. You, you put your emotions into, into check, but as every minute goes by, you start to believe more and more that this might actually happen today. And this little voice on your shoulder is going, this is exciting, this is exciting. Part of you is going, be calm, it's probably not actually gonna happen today. But with each ticking minute, you, that voice gets louder and louder. When you're about uh, 30 seconds from launch, the vehicle is completely alive underneath you. It's like you're, it's like you're on top of a big dragon that, it, that is stirring and coming to life. And then six seconds before launch, uh, the engines start to light and the, the space shuttle was strapped to a great big gas tank and the engines didn't push right up through the middle so 
the whole, as the engine started to light, it would bend the whole thing. You feel the whole vehicle get torqued by the, by the force pouring out the back and you get swayed forward and then reach like an elastic limit of the space shuttle, like a big tuning fork until it creaked to a stop and then hit back vertical. It took about six seconds, call it the twang. And as it hit vertical coming back again, then the two solid rockets, rockets would light. And, uh, and you know for sure when you have seven million pounds of thrust that you are going somewhere today. Uh, and uh, you go, it's hugely violent. It's, it's the vibration, because it's a tank and a shuttle and two solid rockets, it's a bunch of stuff all bolted together, so it shakes a lot. It's not one solid piece. So high vibration, enormous force, like someone has their foot in the small of their, your back and they're just pushing you harder and harder and harder as you're, uh, as you're getting accelerated straight up. And in 45 seconds, you're going through the speed of sound, straight up, accelerating. You know, Chuck Yeager's big accomplishment and you're going straight through it on the way up. And in 70 seconds, you're higher and faster than the Concorde ever went. Two minutes, the solid rockets are empty, they explode off and in a big flash and fall down into the ocean to get used again. And then another six minutes and uh, 40 seconds of just like, like sitting in a dragster with your foot to the floor, just going faster and faster and faster uh, until at the end of it, you are going uh, Mach 25, 25 times the speed of sound. You're going 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, five miles a second from LA to Boston in 10 minutes. You're going that fast after nine minutes and you're getting squished and pummeled in your chair, and then all of a sudden, instantly, the engine shut off, and you're weightless. Just like that. I really like launches. They're, they're a lot of fun. You, I, I got to do it three times, and that's how you get to, that's about, that's about how long it took. I've been here about eight minutes. That's how long it takes to get to space. It's a lot of fun. Um, I got all sorts of stuff I could talk about, but do anybody have any questions? I'll uh, I'll try and answer questions. Yes, young man there. Say it real loud. What? The question is, did I leave my guitar in space? Uh, the short answer is yes. On my, I flew in space three times. On my first flight, I had a guitar made up in Eugene, Oregon. It was custom made to take up to the early Russian space station, Mir. And uh, I took it up there and gave it as a gift to the crew of Mir. And it stayed up in orbit for about four years. So I think about 20,000 times around the world. And, uh, and then on the last shuttle flight to Mir, they brought it back. And now it's in an air and space museum. So that one stayed in space a long time. But the one that I played this year up in space and recorded all the music. And I recorded a whole CD's worth of original music up there that I wrote. I just, I've been busy since I got back and I haven't had a chance to do anything with the music yet. But um, the one that I played uh, that you've maybe seen videos of, it's still on the space station. And in fact, look, nice mustache, young lady. That looks really nice. I like it. Oh, those are cool. Um, <laughs> in fact, right now, three of my friends are getting in a spaceship to come home. Right now, they're in their little spaceship about to come home this afternoon. One of them is Luca Parmitano, and Luca and I play together, guitar together on Earth lots. And he played that guitar up there. And there's a new guy just got up there this week named Mikhail Turin, who's a Russian, who's a really good guitar player. So that guitar is up there for everybody. It's the space station guitar, and it's been up there for about 70,000 orbits of the world, which is like, more than Keith Richards. <laughs> Anybody over here have a question? Yes. The question was, did I ever participate in an ARIS contact with students around the world? ARIS is uh, ham radio. Uh, amateur radio to the ISS, ARIS. ASA, NASA loves acronyms, so an ARIS contact. The beauty of, a, of doing a ham radio contact is that some small community somewhere could learn how to use ham radio, could understand how radio waves work and how the atmosphere works, and figure out all the time, and 
get it all set up, and then I could just float into the Columbus Laboratory and turn on my Eris radio, dial it up the right channel, push the button, and suddenly be talking to students sitting in their auditorium somewhere in a school somewhere around the world. And I talked to students pretty much every week the whole time I was up there uh, on all three of my flights. I talked to students all over. The, f the funniest story I had with the ham radio, I mean, it was great talking to the students, but the funniest one was there's, there's this fellow who lives in northern Canada, and his hobby is ham radio. And sometimes, if you listen really carefully, you can just hear someone on the ground who's trying to talk to you. And, uh, and he was there going, it was when I was on Space Shuttle Atlantis, and he said, Space Shuttle Atlantis, this is whatever his call sign was here in, you know, Alberta. Space Shuttle Atlantis, and I came down and said, oh, hello there, Alberta, this is Space Shuttle Atlantis. He said, hello, Space Shuttle Atlantis, is that really you? His voice went up like two octaves. And he was so excited, and then the newspapers went to his little house out in the middle of nowhere, and he, he was like in all the media. And it was back in 1995, when the, the last time the government here was in furlough. And so, in fact, the Prime Minister of Canada couldn't talk to me when I was in space because NASA was having a furlough and there was nobody there. But this little guy in his booth in Norbert, Alberta, talked to me directly on ham radio, so it was pretty cute. What was the most interesting experiment that I did on the space station? Um, there's an experiment up there called microflow. And you can actually take now, take a blood sample, and there's a, it's a box about as big as a toaster. And you can put a blood sample into it, and it goes through a fiber optic tube and in front of a little laser detector, and we can do blood analysis on our own blood in about 10 minutes on board the space station. And normally, I mean, you have to go to a hospital and you have to have centrifuges and all the testing and all the equipment. And one of the real beauties of space flight is that it brings people together that wouldn't normally talk to each other, researchers and scientists and, and um, engineers. And we need equipment like that on the space station, but as soon as you invent the box like that, it has huge application for all the remote communities around the world where you can have a portable uh, blood cytometer that now they can do blood flow research. And it's now in its advanced <laughs> stages of certification. It's being tested in, in, uh, in Ghana, in fact, as well. So for me, that was a really nice combination of space research, of serving a purpose for us, but also really serving a good purpose for people back on Earth. Yes. The question was, what did it feel like not looking at the Earth, but looking at outer space? And, uh, and what does it make you think about, right? Um, on board the spaceship, in order to stay in orbit, so let's say this is you on board the spaceship. If you're not going fast, then you just, you just fall straight down and hit the world, because gravity is always there. But on the spaceship, we're going fast enough that we still fall, just like this bottle of water, just a bottle of blood myself, we still fall exactly the same, but we're going fast enough, we're going at uh, five miles a second, so that as you fall, the Earth curves. So that's what determines how fast you have to go, is you fall at the rate that the Earth curves, five miles a second. So the reason I say that is that means you go around the world in 90 minutes. So if you want to look at the universe, um, you got to think about it. There's the sun. If this is the world, you go around it in 90 minutes, so you get 45 or 50 minutes of sunlight, and then maybe 35 or 40 minutes of dark. And you're working. So your nights are really short, right? You got a 40 second or 40 minute night, and you're busy. So if you really want to look at the universe, you've got to plan ahead and you need to shut off all the lights and you need to let your eyes adjust for a while because it takes about 15 minutes to get all the rods and cones properly all sensitized and your pupil all opened up. So you don't see the rest of the universe that often. It's sort of like inside your house. You know, you hardly ever look at the stars from inside your living room. Um, but when you do, especially when you're outside on a spacewalk, and that's when I really looked at the universe um, it, is, it is very different. Here, 
when we look at the universe, we look up. And, and the blackness of the sky is above us, and we feel grounded, we feel stable, we're looking up at the universe. When you're out on a spacewalk and you look at the universe, it's below you and around you, and you're in it. And the world is just sort of this thing near you, but you aren't grounded with the world. You are alone in the universe, so it feels different. And when, um, when Paul Fjeld was helping us design our mission patch, which has a black background, we said, we want the blackness of space to be black. And he said, okay, and he made it black. And we looked at it and went, well, it's, it's not black enough. And he said, well, you know, it's black. And <laughs> was, but he said, what do you mean not black enough? And we were trying to describe it to him. It is, it is a depth of darkness that has like a texture to it when you look at the universe. It is, you can feel the, 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 the dust of the endlessness of the universe in the color of it. It is just so profoundly deep. You stare off into it, you're looking forever. And here it's filtered by the atmosphere and the stars twinkle. When you get above the air, the stars don't twinkle. They, they're a perfect point of light because there's no, no water vapor and, and air and heat waves and things in the way. So an unending, unending uh, bottomless well of darkness and opportunity. It's, it's, um, it's amazing to look at. <coughs> yes, sir. <laughs> the question is, um, normally the space station has six people on it, and then, but the vehicle that takes us up and down and has for the last 13 years is the Soyuz, and it has three seats in it. So that means after six of us there for a while, and then it's time, like right now, with, um, with Luca and Fyodor and Karen, they're going to get in their spaceship and come home, and then the crew would go down to three for a while. And it would be down to three people on this huge space station for at least a couple of weeks until you're waiting for another ship to come up. So the question was, do you feel lonely that your friends just left and you got this big empty spaceship? Or do you feel like, all right, I got all this extra room and all this extra space and more food? Um, <laughs> and you actually, you feel more vulnerable because within the three people on the space station, you have to have every skill set that will keep you alive. If you think, if someone in this room right now had, an, uh, had a, a seizure or a heart attack or tripped and hurt their leg, or if the lights went out in the room, or if the toilet started backing up, or if uh, the computer system in Barnes & Noble went down, or anything happened, if we caught on fire, we would be counting for almost all of those circumstances for somebody else to be the expert to take care of it. But if there's only three of you in the universe, then you have to know how to do all of those things. And so we train for them for years and years. But uh, I mean, I worked in, the, in Herman Hospital in Houston. I worked in the cadaver lab. I worked in the eye lab, the burn ward, the dental lab. And, I, and then I worked actually sewing people up and stapling people up and catheters and intubation and everything. Just on the off chance that during that time, somebody got sick and I had to go do the medical work on them. And we trained for everything that way. And so when you're down to three people, you realize you're slightly more exposed in risk. But at the same time, this huge spaceship is yours. And in my case, when that other crew undocked, the moment they undocked, not only was the spaceship ours, but I became commander of the International Space Station. And I first dreamed about being an astronaut when I was nine, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon. and. Uh, and, you know, it had been something I'd been pursuing and imagining and, and training for my entire life. And to see their Soyuz safely undock and start backing away came with me the great joy and responsibility of realizing that I am now being trusted with the world's spaceship. And, it, and I'm the commander of this thing. And it was, it was a little bit uh, daunting, but at the same time, uh, hugely exciting and so I did have a lot of that feeling of I like this this is mine now this is this is a big opportunity and uh, and uh, and this this whole thing is in our hands so yeah it's, it's it was a great day yes.
question is what I feel about Canada not having their own launch vehicle and what does that mean for the future of the Canadian Space Agency. There's a big misperception, including in, in uh, American launch vehicles. There's a lot of people, I've had people come up to me and say, oh, it's terrible now that NASA's canceled. <laughs> because the space shuttle reached the end of its life. And it's, it's such a puzzling attitude to me in that they think the purpose of a space program is to watch a space shuttle's engine light. They have no idea what happens after that, but the space shuttle launched and therefore we have a space program. And uh, that's only one tiny little piece and the shuttle was just one of dozens of vehicles that go to space. And uh, we have people permanently living on the space station for the last 13 years ago this month. We left Earth as a permanent species 13 years ago this month. We've been living on the space station from all those different nations since then. And there are vehicles going all over the solar system and there's Curiosity driving around Mars discovered that there's in every cubic foot of dirt on Mars there's a quart of water. Mars is oceans of water in the surface. There's just so much stuff going on and it's not all about launch. Launch is, is an important part, but there's lots of launch capability all around the world. The, the Chinese, the Indian nation just sent uh, a vehicle to Mars, and Japan has launch capability, and Europe has launch capability. It's, it's not necessary that everybody spends the huge amount of money and infrastructure to have the ability to launch. It's, it's not efficient. It'd be like if every city in the U.S. had to have their own car company or something. You know, you, you, it doesn't make sense. You want to do some things on an interstate or an international basis. The key is, what is it about this technology and this industry that you can specialize in so that it becomes worthwhile? And the name of the book is An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth because what we do in space is inherently irrelevant. What matters is, what does it mean to us back here on the surface? That's what matters. And so each country, each organization finds some part of it that, that is of great interest to them. And Canada, just like all the other nations, has done that. Canada has been in space since 1961. We're the third nation in space after the Soviet Union and the US and has a long, proud history, just like all the other partners. And and has a great opportunity coming up, just like, I mean, the replacement for the shuttle, the first flight of it is next September. Most people don't even think about that. And we, we regularly launch people up and back and have multiple vehicles going to the space station and back. And, and uh, Elon Musk is leading the charge for uh, another vehicle that can go to station besides the Soyuz. And the Chinese are going to the moon. There's huge opportunity going on for Canada and for all the other countries. So like always, uh, you can either look at it and go, well, these things don't exist, or you can look at it and go, wow, look at all these things that do exist, and uh, there's great opportunity. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Yep. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, do you think the, uh, or have you noticed like the, the career path to becoming an astronaut has changed to any great degree since you went through your whole uh, career? The question was, has the, uh, the sort of the traditional career path to become an astronaut stayed the same or changed over the years? When I decided to be an astronaut, I was nine years old. And uh, I had no idea how to become an astronaut. I was nine years old, right? I didn't know anything. And also, at the time, I was Canadian, and Canada didn't even have an astronaut program. So it's not like uh, it was hard. At that time, it was impossible. Right? There was no program. It's like I want to decide to become Spider-Man. You know, you can't, it doesn't happen, you can't do it. So I didn't know. But uh, I figured you fly in space, so the verb is to fly. So I should learn to fly, because that's obviously going to be part of it. So as a teenager, I looked for organizations that would teach me to fly. And those exist everywhere, uh, Civil Air Patrol or privately or whatever you like. Uh, and I looked at the astronauts, and they, um, they didn't look like they were way out of shape. You know, they looked like they fit inside their space suits. So I decided, OK, I got to keep myself, can't be a big fat astronaut, got to keep myself in shape. So, uh, so I resolved to do that. And they learned complicated things. So I decided I was going to have to go to university. And 
and uh, study something technical. And so I did that. And then the last part, I had no idea. What do you do after that? But the last piece, and that's what NASA looks for, is a, a high level of fitness, uh, a lot of practical experience, an ability to learn complicated things. So like an, an advanced university degree, a master's or a PhD, is a proven ability to learn complicated things. But then the last piece of the puzzle is uh, an, a proven ability to make good decisions when the consequences matter. And so that's why they choose like test pilots, because if you're a test pilot who can't make good decisions, then you're a dead test pilot. So, so that's a nice filter, you know. Um, and, they, and they choose uh, medical doctors, you know, uh, emergency room medical doctors, and people who have managed programs. And so that's really what we've always looked for. You don't have to be military. You don't have to, have, there's no specific requirement, but a combination of fitness, high level of academic achievement, and then a proven ability to make good decisions uh, after you got out of school. And, and then that narrows it down to like 500 people. And then they're looking for what else have you done? If you're gonna spend six months with this person, how are they gonna be interesting on the space station? Do they speak languages? Do they play music? Have they traveled the world? Have they worked in social programs? You know, what sort of person are they? But the core competence, the core ability to do the job is what really is necessary. And that, that's the biggest part to focus on. I think uh, we're about on time. Okay, maybe one more question. Yes. Okay, four-year-old daughter in green. What's your question? So Esme and I are going to talk about cooking in space. So Esme, what did you have to eat today? So Esme had just a sandwich today. All right. So did your sandwich have bread? Yeah. Let's think about bread in space. You know, when you're eating bread, sometimes you make crumbs, right? And when you finish your plate afterwards, there's, always, there's a few crumbs left on the plate, right? Well, imagine if you were floating around weightless. Here, float her around weightless. Imagine, Esme, if you were floating around weightless, you and your crumbs, and were floating all over the spaceship, and hair was floating everywhere. Um, your, your crumbs would be, your crumbs from your sandwich, the crumbs from your sandwich would be getting in your eyes, and you'd breathe them, and they'd get into all the equipment and the machinery, so we don't have bread in space because of the crumbs and we don't have cake and we don't have potato chips because of the crumbs but we have tortillas because tortillas don't make crumbs uh, and so but we have peanut butter and we have honey so you can make a tortilla peanut butter and honey sandwich because they keep a long time but we don't have a refrigerator because they're big and heavy and they take a lot of power and our machines that come up and down don't have refrigerators so all of our food, there's probably in your kitchen, in the cupboards, is where you keep the food that doesn't need to be in the refrigerator. And so in there, you probably have cans of soup and dried packages and dried fruit and things that'll keep long, long time. And that's the sort of food we have. We don't really cook in space. We just reheat. <laughs> we just open food up and eat it. So it's sort of like being on a camping trip forever. Or like... Uh, <laughs> Or like, if you go to school, if, the, if your mom or your dad packs a little lunch for you that you would carry to school that could keep all day without going in a fridge, that's the sort of food we have in space. And was your sandwich good today? Yeah, space flight is pretty good too. That's what we eat in space. Okay, I think we're gonna, um, thanks very much. I think we're gonna get set up to uh, sign books. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, the book is the culmination of 20 years of giving talks all around the world about not only what is it like to fly in space, but also what does it mean 
what what are the point what's the point of it and what are the lessons that you could maybe learn from that that would be useful not just for astronauts but for everybody so thanks very much for coming today i hope you enjoy the book and i will sign every single one that i can